Hey, young women of the Citrus Heights Stake. My name is Tony Overbay, and I have been asked to answer some mental health related questions for you. And I'm going to try to do this on one take. I'm so used to when I do, uh, I've got a podcast, and a lot of times I might have to edit some things together. So uh, let's see, let's get, let's get ready. Let's see if we can do this in one take. You are in my therapy office, though. And uh, if you were here, you would say I have a wonderful candle burning. It's very therapeutic. There's a couch behind. And uh, so uh, I want you to be comfortable and relax because we talk about some mental health things. So I was asked first to give a little bit of background. Um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm a, a father of four. My youngest is 16. I've got uh, what, 16, 18, 20, and 22 and uh, live in Lincoln. I taught seminary, early morning seminary for about seven years, which I absolutely loved. I currently teach Sunday school. I've spent some time in the nursery, which actually was a very fun time and uh, served in a bishopric, been a young men's president or two, uh, that, that, that kind of thing. So I've thoroughly enjoyed my service in the church, and I graduated from the University of Utah with a degree in mass communication. Sorry if there are BYU fans who are, who are sighing or booing right now. I can understand. It's okay. I have two daughters going to BYU, Idaho right now, and I uh, got my master's in um, counseling in, uh, in my 30s. So I actually did a, a 10 years in computer software and I kind of felt called to go back and get my master's in counseling. And it was one of the greatest decisions that I've ever made. So I've been a licensed marriage and family therapist for 15 years now. And, uh, and I also have a podcast called The Virtual Couch, which has just been a lot of fun to, uh, to host a couple of hundred episodes of that. And I've got to um, interview a lot of fun people. So there's a little bit of background. I've been married 29 years to my high school sweetheart. That's where we would insert the aw, right? And uh, we'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary coming up in September. And I do know the date. I believe it's the 28th. So, but I'm, I'm grateful to be here and to answer some questions for you with regard to mental health. I have them on my iPad, so I'll be referring to some notes. So, um, and, uh, but I am, I am so grateful. I'm actually, let me just share as well. I'm a convert to the church. So I grew up in Utah, um, not a member of the church. Usually I insert some sort of joke in there that uh, I was the one or back then it was against the law or that sort of thing. But I had good high school friends who actually brought me to the church. And so I am so grateful for each one of you and for the wonderful influence that you get to be on your friends around you. So um, I, I just had some amazing friends that would just simply invite me to activities. You know, it's funny, I now know, because I, I served in a bishopric for a number of years as well, and I now know that I was the project. I believe, you know, I was that guy that everybody would say, um, in BYC, Bishop's Youth Council meetings, if you've ever been in one of those meetings or a ward council, where they would say, well, we invited uh, Tony Overbay to church, and uh, we're going to try to get him out here on Sunday. And so it's kind of fun to know that, uh, that maybe I was supposed to. And I remember one amazing evening where I was spending the night at my friend Shim's house, and uh, he had a sleepover. So, um, you know, back then, uh, I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. I know we've kind of gone back and forth on some of those things uh, growing up as a parent here as well. But Shim's got me over there. We're playing video games and we're talking old, old. This is so long ago. Um, regular Nintendo. I mean, not even Super Nintendo and not uh, and Wii's. Those things were just, uh, they were just dreams in, in some engineer's brain at that point. But we're playing Nintendo. It's getting late. He seems a little bit awkward and I don't know why. And so then right before we go to bed, he finally just says, you know, Tony, I I really want to share this uh, message about this book with, with you. And he was bearing his testimony of the Book of Mormon. It was so incredibly sweet and touching at the time. And I remember um, at the time really not understanding what he was doing, but I really felt, I felt the spirit. I look back and that was one of the first times I think I can recognize, oh, that was something different, that that was the spirit. And so um, it was a few years later that I finally joined the church. But uh, I remember that very well when he bore his testimony of the Book of Mormon to me. Okay, let's, uh, let's get to these questions and, uh, and ask some of these. So question, and, and they're, uh, they're provided to me in a bit of a spreadsheet. So I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to exactly uh, answer the questions. There's some things that say, what do you struggle with? And there's some different responders, and it's just numbers. I don't have names or anything like that. But uh, one says, um, what do you struggle with? There's uh, stress or social anxiety, depression, um, body positivity, or stress, especially when plans change. So we're going we're gonna to address each one of those. And, uh, but here's the questions. What questions would you like to ask? And I'm just going to kind of go through these and then we'll, we'll kind of circle back around and hit some of them in general. So what can I do to battle stress? Um, how can I have more courage to speak up and participate in social events? And I just want to say these are such, these are such good questions. Um, what do I do if I don't feel comfortable at church? Uh, everybody has stress. How do you know if you have more than what's normal or healthy? 
how to learn to deal with social anxiety and move on from an eating disorder. What is the best way to help those who struggle with depression? How can I maintain good friendships through social distancing? And how can I be happy when plans change and deal with disappointment? So um, I'm gonna jump in and, and answer a lot of these in general or in, in particular, but I wanna give a little bit of a general statement at first that I think will address a lot of these. And one of these is I want you to know that uh, a lot of times the message that you'll hear in media, especially social media, is this concept that all you have to do is just choose to be happy and you will be happy the rest of that day, that week, and, uh, and life will just you know, become uh, rainbows and unicorns and uh, pots of gold. And, and I just wanna let you know that I understand that that message, it bless its heart. It's a wonderful message to, to be put out there. And for some, if they can just wake up in the morning and say, you know what, today, doggone it, I'm gonna be happy and it's gonna work, then that's great. But, but I think a lot of times when people st struggle with things like stress or anxiety, depression, social anxiety, that a lot of it comes from this feeling that, that we're doing something wrong, that like something's wrong with us, that we're broken with inside, because we can't just decide to just be happy and have it stick. So I just want you to know that that's, that's okay, um, because, and, and I'm a big evidence-based data guy, but so the research really shows that um, when we just hear these constant messages of it, just, just be happy, just don't worry about things, just move forward, just be the best you can be, that they kind of overlook a lot of those struggles that a lot of us are going through. So we can wake up one morning and say, I got this, I'm gonna be happy. I can't wait to be happy. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're late for a class and uh, you didn't mean to be, or you get a flat tire on the way to school, or, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a dog gets sick on the carpet on your way out and you gotta deal with it. And all of a sudden you're not happy and you think, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? I told myself I was gonna be happy this morning. So I just want you to know that you're human. I mean, that's, that's the thing that you are a, a daughter of God and that uh, you do have your own unique talents, abilities. DNC 46, I think, talks about these gifts of the spirit. So for some, those gifts are gonna be uh, just, in, and maybe some wonderful positivity at all turns. For some, that gift might be just a blind, you know, blind obedient faith and they never question. But for others, you're going to have more of a questioning mind or you're gonna have uh, a little bit more anxiety, a little bit more fear or worry. And some of those things are just gonna kind of come, you know, nature, nurture, part of who we are in our DNA. And so just please know that, that you're not broken. There's a, there's a wonderful concept in therapy that uh, there's a type of therapy that I love. It's called acceptance and commitment therapy, or the acronym is ACT. So I might refer to that a few times. But in ACT, what we talk about is that we are and this is where I love this ties in with the gospel. We're the only, you are the only version of you that has ever walked the face of the earth. You, whatever your name is, state your name, uh, even if you want to do it right now out loud. Um, but you are the only version of you that's ever walked the face of the earth. You're the only person that's been through all of the experiences that you've had, all of the nature and the nurture and your birth order and your DNA and, and some who have had loss or, or abandonment or rejection or fear or so all of those experiences are who, what makes you who you are. It's what makes me who I am. And I know that I'm a child of God. So I love beginning any of these kind of questions by saying the reason you feel or think or do the things that you do is because you're human. And it's because you are a, a, a daughter of God. So I want to start by saying, let's just start by saying, you're okay. You know, I, I, I don't want to start by saying, something's wrong with me, or I'm broken, or that sort of thing. No, you have the feelings, thoughts that you have because you're human, because you're a daughter of God. So let's start there, okay? So then that, that kind of frame uh, sets the, the table for some wonderful answers to these questions, I hope. So when, when we say, uh, what can a girl do to battle stress, or how can I have more courage to speak up and participate in social events? So we've got kind of a concept number two, is that if we're all these individual children of God, well, guess what? And Doctrine and Covenants 46 says we all come to the table with these different strings, these different blessings, these different abilities and talents, then we're all going to respond to things a little bit differently. And, and here's what I love about this. What, what's really important is to kind of really understand who you are. What are the things that you like? For some, it's going to be really easy to go out and put yourself out there socially. For others, that's going to be really difficult. And so we all have these different values that kind of are within us. So one of us might have a real value of connection that we really desperately want to connect with others. While somebody else might have a value of, um, of justice where, man, that's not fair. And that really resonates with them. So this, this concept of equality or fairness. 
and others might have a, a value of, of fun and adventure. And so if they aren't doing something fun and adventurous all the time, then they feel like they're just, they're, they're going crazy, you know? And so a lot of, of what causes us stress or anxiety is when we feel like we're doing something because we're supposed to or because we have to. And let me give you this example. And I, and I, I think this might, might uh, kind of bring these points together. So social anxiety, I deal a lot with social anxiety. And a long time ago, I worked with a client that had been, I'm, when I saw the client, uh, he, was, uh, he, was, he was in pretty good shape, but he had spent his whole teenage years um, very, very much overweight. So when he would come into a room, people would look at him and, uh, and they would oftentimes, they, they weren't the nicest to him. So it had caused him to have a lot of social anxiety of kind of putting himself out there and being in, in public. But when I was seeing him in his 20s, uh, he had lost some a weight and he had kind of felt a little bit more confident. But then he would go into a room and people would turn and look at him and he would still feel like, oh my gosh, they're, they're totally judging me. I want to leave. And so here's where that concept, the therapy concept I'm talking about, this act, this acceptance and commitment therapy comes into play. So he has those thoughts and those feelings, those emotions that people are looking at him, that maybe they're, they're judging him or that sort of thing because he's human, because he's the only person that's been through life in his body and having his experience. But what's his goal? So his goal is to connect with others. So he has this value of, of just this value of connection or friendship. So he has this value of connection, or friendship, this goal of going out there and connecting with others. So when he puts himself in that situation, his brain might kind of say, well, yeah, but they're, they're making fun of you. Or yeah, but this is really awkward. And how often do we hear that little voice in our head that says, yeah, but this is going to be a little bit scary. Or yeah, but what if you don't know what to say? And a lot of times then we believe that story. They call it cognitive fusion if we want to get all fancy, some fancy psychological terms. So our brain is trying to hook us to this story, this, this, this story over here. And I have clients, a lot of times they're saying, okay, can that possibly be Satan? You know? And so whatever we want to call it, but when, our, when we have this goal, and it's a good goal, and we want to go and we want to connect with friends, and that's this goal, and their value is connection and friendship, but it feels uncomfortable, that's because a lot of times we just, our brain wants us to have the path of least resistance. It wants us to do the kind of more comfortable thing because that's a little bit easier, right? Now, it won't lead to us being a little happier at the end of the day, but a lot of times when we go to put ourselves in these situations, the brain's saying, this might be awkward. So here's one of the coolest things that we can do. We can acknowledge that, okay, uh, thank you, brain. I appreciate what you're trying to do for me. You really mean well. Bless your, I would say, bless your pink, squishy heart. I don't know if our brain really has a heart. probably doesn't, but you get my point. So we want to enter this situation, this social situation, but it's scary, but it's our goal. Our goal is to be social and our value is connection with others. And that feels right. And those come from being a, a daughter of God. Like that's who we are. That's our gifts that we want to bring to the table. But then our brain will say, might be awkward. So here's the best thing we can do. Thank you, brain. It might be awkward, but we're not even, we're not, that's not even the debate. We're not even debating if this might be awkward or not. True or false? Maybe, maybe that's the case. Maybe, maybe not. But is it a productive thought toward my goal of connecting with others? And so if it's not a productive goal that doesn't get us closer to this goal, then we kindly thank our brain, kind of get ourselves a little bit centered, you know, we get a little bit focused, maybe a little bit of in through the nose, out through the mouth breathing, lower our heart rate, and we re-enter the situation. And then watch your brain. It's pretty amazing. That will say, well, what if there's nobody to sit by? Or what if you don't really know what to say next? And then it's the same thing. Bless your brain's heart. It's trying to hook you on these stories because it thinks that it's really scary to go talk to these people. So again, we kind of take a little breath. We thank our brain. Thank you. I appreciate what you're trying to do for me, brain. But I'm going to just kindly uh, defuse from you and go back and do what I really feel is this, this value-based goal that I want to do. So I, I hope that makes sense. I feel like that's one of the biggest lessons that I love teaching that has to do with mental health in general, that a lot of times the anxiety or the stress that we have or those feelings of depression come from us feeling like we, we don't know how to do things or that we can't do things or that new things are scary. And here's the thing, I'm not even, we're not even arguing or debating if they're scary. So we learn how to feel those feelings or acknowledge those feelings, acknowledge those emotions and then say, man, thank you. Thank you, brain. Like, I know you mean well. You're trying to protect me. But boy, if I just rely on, on what you're telling me right now, I'm not going to put myself out there. And I might miss out on some, 
opportunities like a girls camp or, or, or college or mutual or hanging out with friends or down the road, going on dates or those sort of things. And so I feel like that's one of those keys to anxiety is recognizing that we can have these feelings and these emotions because we're human, because we've had a lot of these different experiences in our lives. But we can also just recognize that a feeling can just be a feeling or a thought can just be a thought. We're going to have plenty more thoughts that are going to come right after this thought that tried to catch me or hook me. Or we're going to have plenty more emotions or feelings that are coming along. But we assign a certain amount of meaning to these feelings or thoughts or emotions. And then we kind of just start to believe them. We start to kind of lean into them. And they keep us away from maybe what our real goal is to connect with others or to communicate with others. So I feel like uh, if you were following me there at all, that that might have answered a, a fair amount of these questions. If we go back to what can a girl do to battle stress, it's to really recognize what's important. What's your value based goal that you want to achieve? Is it connection? Is it friendship? If it is, then, then let's start leaning toward that. And you're still going to feel some, some anxiety, a little bit of anxiety, because that's that fear of the unknown. It's that path of least resistance that your brain wants to take. Okay, sorry, I just set the iPad down. So I'm going to go on a little tangent, but I think you'll appreciate this. So let's talk about what anxiety is in general. So what anxiety is, is when you feel nervous or when you feel, um, when you feel fear that your heart rate starts to elevate a little bit. That means it'll start to beat a little bit faster. And when your heart rate starts to beat a little bit faster, there's a little part of your brain called the amygdala for anybody who is maybe taking notes, the amygdala. And that is the emotional part of your brain. And when the heartbeat raises, what the amygdala does is it sends out a little bit of this chemical called cortisol. It's a stress hormone. And when your brain gets cortisol, then it thinks, oh, I got to be ready. I think there's something that might be happening. That's what anxiety is. It's, it's starting to, it's your body's way to alert you to potential danger or fear. So when your heart rate raises and your amygdala sends out a little bit of the stress hormone cortisol, here's what happens next. Um, you got another part of your brain, mine's very large right here, you can tell. It's called the prefrontal cortex. And that's the part where you make sense of things. That's the logical part of your brain. So here's how the Lord, you know, Heavenly Father's made an amazing device in the brain is that when we start to get a little bit anxious or we start to get nervous or we start to get worried or there's fear, then this amygdala that the emotional part of the brain puts out this cortisol, this stress hormone. And when the, the front part of our logical part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, when it gets that, that cortisol, it actually starts to shut down. If, if I hooked you up to a functional brain scan right now, and that would be very cool, that when your heart re, heartbeat started to raise, you started to kind of get a little bit nervous or anxious, and, that, and you started to put out this stress hormone, cortisol, the front part of your brain actually starts to shut off, like little light switches flipping off. Because when you are starting to go and get excited and fearful and, and nerve, excuse me, nervous, then that's called, you might have heard of this before, fight, flight, or freeze. Your brain's getting ready to either take flight, get out of here, take fight, like I got to fight for my life, or freeze. Oh, I, hope, I hope that you know, the, the, uh, the saber-toothed tiger that is walking by doesn't see me. And so all of those are survival instincts. And so that's what causes us to kind of go into these senses of stress or panic or that sort of thing. So the best thing you can do truly is when you start to recognize, I'm starting to get a little anxious, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous, you just kind of step back and you do, you take a nice deep breath in and do in through your nose, you do it for about three seconds, some people's three or four. I hope you're doing it right there. And in a, in a perfect world, you hold it in for maybe three seconds as well. And then you expel out through your mouth for three seconds. And then you kind of just relax for three seconds and you can repeat. And so here's the magical thing that's happening. When you do this breathing, you are actually then lowering your heart rate. And so now let's go back and reverse all those things I just told you about stress and anxiety. When you're lowering your heart rate, now all of a sudden your brain stops sending out that cortisol, that stress hormone. So now all of a sudden the logical part of your brain, those light switches start flipping back on. Now you can kind of be a little bit more rational, a little more logical. So if you really think about the way that stress or anxiety works, it really is because all of a sudden we get a little bit worried. We get a little bit nervous about what we're going to say to somebody or what we're going to do. And then our brain kind of sends this ah, signal to our heart. We start to pump out. It beats a little faster starts to elevate, starts to put out this uh, stress hormone cortisol, the logical part of our brain starts to kind of shut down. 
And so our brain, our body, it's made to just work so beautifully, but it thinks it's doing us a favor when in reality, it kind of is just keeping us away from what we really want, this social connection, that sort of thing. Let me check the time. All right, I am going a little long, I apologize. Let me keep going, let me get through these questions. So what can I do to battle stress? It's to really figure out, um, remember, you're a daughter of God, kind of, kind of figure out what those value-based goals are that you want, if it is connection, if it is friendship, is it, if it is adventure or fun, and then, and then just be aware that your brain is going to, bless its heart, try to kind of get you onto this path of least resistance. And so think it, take a little breath, and then re-engage, re-engage in whatever the activity is, whether it's an activity at a camp, whether it's an activity at mutual or activity at school, whether it's connecting with friends, whatever that is, re-engage. So that's one of the best things that you can do. Um, how can I have more courage to speak up and participate in social events? So now one of the best things that you can do as we've kind of laid out this framework is find out what you can offer in one of these um, social events. Is, so if you are trying to talk about something that you don't really know a lot about, then that can, again, cause anxiety. Or if you really, if your goal is to speak up in a social event, then all you're really, not all, but then start to pay attention to those stories my brain is trying to tell me. That it might be the thing about, well, you might not be eloquent in your speech, or you might not be, you, you might not be um, saying something that is intelligent to someone else. And so if those are the case, but your goal is to participate in that social event, then kindly thank your brain for trying to protect you, and then take a deep breath, and then re-engage in the social activity. But I will say that it's really important to make sure that you are doing things that, that you feel kind of go, again, in line with your values. And so that can be one of the biggest things. When people, I always say, and I'll say this very, very clearly and very uh, slowly, you know, no one likes to be should on. And what I mean by that is if somebody's saying you should speak up, you should say something, you should do this. But if that really doesn't feel like who you are, then you're, you're, it's going to be hard to kind of go speak up in a social activity or an event if it really doesn't feel like that's something that is in line with your value or your value-based goal. Um, all right. Another one says, uh, what do I do if I don't feel comfortable at church? And, and so I feel like hopefully you can kind of see a lot of these scenarios. That's why I laid out that, those fundamentals or that kind of framework of what anxiety and stress is really about is if your goal is to go to church, then the, your brain might throw these stories out at you that says, okay, but I don't feel very comfortable. And so we might be able to say, okay, I thank you brain. And I'm not even arguing if I feel comfortable or not, but is my goal to be there at church? Is my value-based goal to be there at church? And if so, then you can invite those feelings to come along with you. You know, um, don't push uh, those feelings away because, oh, setting the iPad down. Here's another big one. This is one of my favorite terms. It's, excuse me, it's called, Psychological reactance. If I had more time, I would put this across the bottom of the video. Psychological reactance. What is psychological reactance? It is the instant negative reaction we have of being told what to do. We all have it. If you're uh, your boss at work, do this. You know, your brain says, uh, I, I don't want to, maybe I will. I don't know if I will or not. If your parent says, uh, hey, I need you to take out the trash right now. Um, how many of you just jump right up and do it? Uh, probably not all of you, uh, maybe not a lot of you we have this psychological reactance built in this instant negative reaction of being told what to do so we kind of say well i'll do it later and uh and so being aware of this reactance can be pretty pretty helpful because a lot of times we can you know recognize that man am i just am i just saying no because my brain is just uh pushing back against whatever is being said to me and so psychological reactance i like to say is also known as agency we all have it built in uh, in, in psychology, the psychological reactance we say is, is innate, it's built within us. And it's there, psychologists like to say, so that we don't get dominated by an alpha male or a, a corrupt society, you know, so that we will push back, so we will question, that's built within us. And that's why I like to call that, that's agency, that it's there because we still wanna maintain our agency. We know that that's, a, that's something that we know from, uh, from our study of the gospel that is, is with every one of us, it's this agency or the ability to choose or act in a way that we feel like is best for us. So that agency also needs to be in line with our values. So I think that's a big thing as well. So that concept of being told, you need to do this, just recognize that we're gonna have a little bit of this pushback, this, this psychological reactance, and then be able to step back and realize, okay, but is this really something that would help me? You know, 
would it be helpful if I did whatever this thing is that I'm being told you should do this? And if so, then, then kindly thank your brain for having this reactance and just kind of move forward with the activity. Um, everybody has stress. How do you know if you have more stress than what is normal or healthy? That, what a great question. There's a, let me kind of talk about, I'll, I'll skip over and talk a little bit about depression and then circle back around with this, this, this concept. So um, stress, anxiety, depression, it, the person who asked this is absolutely right. We all have times where we feel sad. We all have times where we feel anxious. We all have times where we feel um, uh, stress. And so how do we know when they're, when they're a little bit too much? When that's the case, it's when you typically find yourself not doing things that you truly love or truly enjoy. So, and, and it's key to note as well that there's even situational depression or there can be situational stress or situational anxiety. Um, I'm a therapist, uh, 15 years. I've studied mindfulness for, uh, I do a daily mindfulness practice for over seven years. I like to think that I'm very calm and zen-like, but there are still just certain situations that come up that I feel a, a rush of anxiety. And so I do these same skills. I thank my brain for providing me with this uh, wonderful, amazing feeling of anxiety. And then I invite those, uh, those feelings of anxiety to come along with me while I continue to do what I feel like I need to do. Those activities are important. So I think the key here is that if you feel like you are crippled by stress or if you are crippled by anxiety or crippled by depression, meaning that you can't do the things that you typically like to do or want to do, then that might be a time to, to talk to somebody about it. Uh, um, talk to your parent, talk to your bishop, talk to a mental health professional, and I think that can go a long way. Um, so what's the best way to uh, learn from social anxiety or move on from an eating disorder? And I, and I really appreciate this one because the um, eating disorders, and I've got a, a couple of podcasts that I've done on this with some experts, uh, oftentimes we say eating disorder, we call it disordered eating, that can just be a really a really unhealthy relationship with food where you know, food's one of those things that we know that we do need to eat to survive, but, but at the core, things like about eating disorders and a lot of times even things about anxiety are about you know, when we feel in our lives oftentimes that we don't necessarily have um, as much control on things in our own life, then our brain really likes order and it likes control and it likes patterns and it likes these you know, things to be very nice and orderly and neat and, and pretty and clean. And so a lot of times when we feel like we don't have control in our lives, then we may find our brain will want to find something that we can control so that we feel like we have a sense of control or order. And oftentimes that's, that can look like a, an eating disorder. So same concepts of being able to, to really recognize and, and, and invite those, those thoughts to come in with us, but then to, to kind, kindly thank those, the brain for having those thoughts of control or order, wanting them. But then acknowledging those, having maybe doing some nice breathing skills, uh, and then engaging with the activity. So it can be with eating is knowing that I need to eat to survive. I need to eat to have energy and fuel to be my best self. And, and again, I know that it's not that easy at, for somebody that can really be struggling with an eating disorder, but being able to recognize that, okay, I'm, I'm okay. You know, what's, what's the story my brain is trying to tell me that I need to control my eating in order to, um, you know, to, to, I don't know, to feel more of whatever that feeling is that the person feels like they're missing. And so being able to kind of diffuse or, or, or breathe through or acknowledge those feelings and then get back to being present and, and, and engaging with the activity that would be most helpful in this scenario would be um, eating, eating healthy foods. So, and let me say, if someone is struggling with an eating disorder, I would really encourage you to talk to a leader, a parent, um, a, a bishop, a mental health professional, because that is something that is uh, that you can work with, and that there's a lot of help for, and uh, and and I really would encourage you to uh, if you're hearing this right now and you're kind of feeling like okay that might be something I'm struggling with, um, talk to somebody about it, and and there is a way to get help for that. So thank you for asking that question. Um, let's see, uh, what's the best way to help those with depression? Let me talk a little bit about empathy. So one of the best ways is that if you are if you have someone in your life that is depressed. Um, one of the best things you can do is just to be there for them. I know that can sound so cliched, but what I mean by that is, is being available, being there and letting them know that, hey, you can talk. I, I want to listen. And one of the things that we do as human beings, and we mean it so well, is we do try to fix. That when people bring to us uh, issues, problems, that sort of thing, 
that we feel like our job is to fix. And a lot of times those fixing statements, um, we mean very well, but where we say a lot of things like, well, uh, yeah, but have you ever thought of it this way? Or, well, yeah, but you know what that's like for me? Or, well, at least this person didn't do this. And all of those statements, even though they're meant well, kind of convey this message of, um, I don't want to, I don't want to hear what you're saying. Let me just tell you how to fix it. So let's talk about empathy. I mean, true empathy and, and, oh, let me do this one. Um, empathy versus sympathy. And I think this will help with, with what we're talking about here. So I like to tell the story where someone is walking down the road and they see someone down in a pit. Um, here's what sympathy sounds like. Sympathy sounds like me looking down and saying, uh, oh my gosh, you're down in a pit. That looks really bad. Oh, I feel so bad for you. I kind of got to go. So I, I hope you're able to get out of that, fit, uh, that pit. I feel so bad. That's sympathy. I, do, I feel bad. I got stuff to do. Empathy is seeing someone down in that pit and jumping down in there and saying, oh my gosh, okay, this is, this is kind of crazy. Tell me what you're, what you're feeling here. What are you seeing? You know, and the person's like, I'm in a pit. You know, and, and even then we're going to want to say, well, uh, have you tried doing this? Have you tried doing that? Have you, but empathy is really saying, what's this like for you? You know, um, are, you, are you afraid of heights? Are you afraid of dirt? You know, uh, are you afraid of this? Or, or what, what are your thoughts? What are your fears? What are your hopes? How do you hope to get out of here? What's this like for you? Have you ever been here before? Tell me more about this. That's empathy. We all want to be heard. You know, I like to say to be healed is to be heard. And so empathy is really trying to get in someone's shoes. Because uh, if, if we, you know, we, we often want to say, no, I know exactly what you're going through. You know, we say that to our friends all the time, right? No, I, 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 I've been there too. Our, our parents, we say that all the time. I know exactly what you're going through, teenager, but really do you, you know, we're, we're I, I think about this all the time. I'm a 50 year old man with older kids. If I try to sell my kids, I know what you're going through, champ, you know, even though we didn't have the internet, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have CDs. I mean, uh, so I don't know what it's like to have instant access to everything in my hand and a phone. Um, I don't know what that's like. I, I mean, we used to have to wait weeks to watch TV shows. Now I can binge on a whole season of stuff on Netflix. I don't know what it's like. And if I try to tell my kids, you should be grateful because when I was a kid, I used to have to walk uphill both ways on broken glass in the snow barefoot. They don't go, oh my gosh, I, we've got it really easy. No, they, they just think, well, you don't understand then. So that same concept comes with our friends, to have empathy. When somebody is struggling with depression or, or any of these things and they come to you, the first thing we can do is, hey, thank you for coming to me. Tell me what this is like for you. Tell me what you're going through. Um, tell me more. And that's, uh, and, and when we feel heard, then that's when people can start to be open to suggestions for help. So, um, I hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, I think we got through these. How can I maintain a good distance, uh, or good friendship through social distancing? Boy, that one can be tough though. It's, we're in a new, the wild, wild west, the new frontier. And I know that things like FaceTime or phone calls or Zoom or that sort of thing aren't as personable. And this is where I go back to some of that stuff we talked about early. We're not even arguing if it's as personable, noted. But if my goal is connection, then the fact that uh, some of these other ways to communicate isn't as personable is true. But it's not a helpful thought if our goal is to connect with others. So uh, right now it is going to require doing a little bit of uh, doing things a little bit differently than we normally would with the hopes that when life gets back to quote normal, whatever that will be, that uh, then we won't have completely kind of stepped away from our friendships or, uh, or those that, that mean a lot to us. Um, okay, I think we covered everything. Uh, last one, how can I be happy when plans change uh, to deal with disappointment? Um, first thing is to recognize that, again, you're human. And if plans change and you're disappointed, note it. It's okay. I mean, it's okay to be, uh, you know, a little bit discouraged when plans change, but then quickly recognize, thank you, brain, for pointing out the fact that plans have changed and you're discouraged. I'm not even arguing that with you. But now I will take a, a deep breath. I will, I will unhook or defuse from those thoughts of this isn't fair. You know, it's like, it's not. We're not even arguing that. Um, but, but now things have changed. So now we will re-engage with whatever the activity is that has changed too. So I just, I appreciate the time I uh, went long. <laughs> so I hope that I don't feel even watch this whole thing. Um, but I appreciate the time. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to you. Um, I love the fact that we're starting to talk more about mental health uh, because 
anxiety, depression, uh, those things, uh, they're real. And there's a, a way to have uh, to get help from them. Um, and just know that you truly are a, a child of God and that you have been sent to earth and you have your own unique set of talents and abilities. And they're not going to be exactly like everyone else. But man, we sure do like to compare ourselves with others, don't we? So um, try, I, I just highly encourage you to just figure out what, what are those things that really are, make you tick, that you're passionate about? What are your, your values? You know, are they values of fun or adventure? Are they values of creativity or compassion? Are they values of honesty and integrity or justice or freedom? Or, you know, there, we all have these different gifts and talents and abilities and values that come from our Heavenly Father. And we need to learn to acknowledge them and kind of lean into them. And when we do that, then we're doing things that will feel more in line with what feels right to us. And then we're going to be in a better place to really be that, uh, that child of God, that person that God has put us on the earth to be, that will put us in a spot to be able to be there and motivate and, and be there for others. <clears throat> I have a huge, huge testimony of the atonement. And this has come through my work as a therapist that I have people in my office every day. I will here in 20 minutes. Um, people that are trying their best. They're just doing their best to, to just use the, the gifts and talents and abilities that, that God has given them um, in an imperfect world and with imperfect people. And that as we do that, that we are going to run into situations that are frustrating. Um, you know, and, and we're just, all of us, we're trying our best. I have people in my office that have dealt with years of, uh, whether it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, you know, uh, uh, you name it. And I've had people in my office and they're just trying, they're really trying to move forward. And so that's where I, it just hits me that the atonement is so real that we just need to keep trying and try our best because the atonement makes up for everything. You know, I love, uh, is it Brad Wilcox's talk where he says um, the atonement doesn't make up, or Christ doesn't make up the difference. Christ is the difference. The atonement doesn't just cover sin. Um, matter of fact, Elder Bednar says that the atonement covers empathy. It covers sorrow. It covers, uh, you know, the feelings of not feeling like you are enough. And um, oh, I should find this, right? Uh, let, me, let me find this really, really quick. Um, okay. This is, uh, this is the part where I was saying I should have uh, had this thing ready, right? Um, okay. Hey, guess what? I, don't, I went to the wrong document. Um, so, but, but the atonement is real. Uh, Christ is the, he makes, he is the difference. And so just keep trying, just keep moving forward. And, uh, and if you do find moments where you feel like you aren't sure what to do, um, make sure you know, put yourself in a position that you can turn to others. I love, there's a Mormon message uh, on the church's website with someone that goes to, uh, someone who's been struggling with uh, depression, anxiety, and they go to a doctor and they, they seek some treatment. And they said that, you know, I'm, I've been praying for help. And, uh, and the doctor um, at that point, you may be seeing this video, says, what if, what if I'm the answer to the prayer? You know, I mean, I'm here for a reason. And I feel like that's the same thing. Your parents, your bishop, um, mental health professionals, friends, that uh, as we open up and turn to others, that there are people there that um, may be put in our lives to really help us out as well. So uh, let, me, let me finish, though. I did find a quote here that is my favorite quote of all time. Um, it's a quote by Neil A. Maxwell, and uh, let me read this one. It's, though of themselves, life's defining moments may seem minor, our wise responses can gradually increase our traction on the demanding path of discipleship. This is where it gets good. He says, for instance, we can decide daily or in an instant with seemingly little things, uh, whether we respond with a smile instead of a scowl, or whether we give warm praise instead of exhibiting icy indifference. Each response matters in its small moment. After all, moments are the molecules that make up eternity, affecting not only ourselves, but others, because our conduct, even in seemingly small things, can be contagious. So I am just grateful that uh, there were some teenagers in my life when I was growing up that uh, their conduct, even in seemingly small things, was truly contagious and helped put me on the path that, uh, that, that got me to this point today, um, which is with an amazing wife, a wonderful family, and blessed with a career that I love and a testimony of the atonement and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I leave that with you. And I just wish the best for you. And I do that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.